Hello and welcome to the Leadership Institute's live webinar. Uh, we have with us here today Nathaniel and Isaiah. Um, what do you guys have for us? Thanks, Carmilla. It's great to be here. I'm Nathaniel Yellis. I work for Heritage Action. I'm here with my debate partner, Isaiah McPeak. We were collegiate debaters together. And tonight I want to talk about um, how, as conservatives, I don't think our biggest weakness is that we're wrong. It's simply that we're not convincing the right people about our ideas. We're either talking to ourselves or talking ineffectively. So I want to know how we can elevate our political arguments, elevate what we're saying into something that actually changes people's minds. And to do that, I want to use the scenario of you, an activist. You've been assigned by your local conservative organization to organize voters in your precinct, in your neighborhood. You get a list of the dozen or so conservative families that live nearby. and They're probably pretty easy to convince to show up at the polls to vote for a conservative candidate who's going to enact the right policies. But in order to win your neighborhood, you've got to get a few of those independent, nonpartisan families on your side. And I want to put yourself in that scenario tonight. How will you convince that independent neighbor to show up and vote for your candidate? And to do that, I'm glad that we have my collegiate debate partner, Isaiah, because he is someone that convincingly communicates. Isaiah? Well, thank you for the support there. Could have used it last time. Uh, something that I'd like to share with you before we get going into the meat of our discussion is this. It, it's really, what is persuasion? What is persuasive force? Because I think we have a false idea in our minds. We think that when we're persuading in the public sphere, that we're Rocky Balboa, and we don't think enough that we're Yoda. We think we're going to conquer instead of thinking we're going to teach. And that can lead to a fundamental problem with discourse today as we have it, which is too many people loudly talking and trying to win, and not enough people asking questions and listening and finding agreement and going for in-depth discussion that changes people. And instead of walking away hurt or deflated or victorious or any of that uh, as, as in a prize fight, debate is more about finding common ground and walking away changed and, and walking away better. That's where we want to be as debaters. And so tonight we're going to talk about three areas where we can see persuasive force being improved. And, and the first is when we start listening with our heart. We need to really listen. And second is when we train our body with the right skills for rhetoric and the right skills of debate. That's part two. And then third and finally, when our mind is quick and sharp. So we're going to work through some examples, some puzzles, some stump the chump questions at the end of the webinar. And we really invite you to ask questions all throughout and, and try to stump us or ask us questions that come from your perspective. Because what this is really about is learning to identify who and what and why someone else thinks something and, and how you can engage with that and change it just a little bit. So the first part of our discussion tonight is really about listening. And the most important skill here is to find agreement before you start talking about disagreement. The classic mistake of argument is to think that you can argue symptomatically when you don't even have shared assumptions. It's the finding of shared assumptions that begins a valid discussion. We need to always start there. If we're talking about immigration, we can't talk about what we think about illegal immigration. We have to talk about first what would be the types of things that would make us think about illegal immigration. What are the numbers? Who or what does it, it is affected by internal versus external enforcement of immigration. Uh, what should taxes be for someone who is here permanently versus someone who is not? All these questions that don't really get into the mess of the argument, which is out here, help us find some sort of agreement to start with. That's the first classic principle of debate. Start from agreement and argue and slowly move towards disagreement. And this is where that scenario of being, uh, being in your neighborhood, talking to your neighbors, your independent, nonpartisan neighbor. Imagine that you're taking out the trash on a Wednesday night, and you finally get the chance to talk to that next door neighbor that you waved hi to for a few years, but they're actually right there with their trash cans. Is the first thing that you say, hey, I'm conservative, and here are the reasons why? 
No, that is not the first thing you say. Is the first thing you say, I hate illegal immigrants? No, you're not going to say that. The first thing you say is probably going to be, hi. And then after that, some innocuous comment about the weather or the traffic on your street or how expensive it is to pay for trash pickup in your neighborhood. Why? Because those are the points of agreement at which you and your independent voting neighbor can build a little friendship that will make them actually listen to you when it comes time to convince them that your candidate is the one to vote for and that they should actually vote in the upcoming election. Finding points of agreement is what builds the relationships that actually make you effective. So really when it comes to effective debate, the principle is listen first, ask questions later, and then you can start to have a debate. One of my favorite quotes is by Aristotle. He says, it is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. The heart of good debating is to ask questions, truly listen, and try to understand someone else's perspective, entertain that thought, see from their viewpoint, and then argue how that viewpoint might be shifted from where it concludes based on what the viewpoint already is. You have to start with questions and looking from another person's viewpoint to be effective at persuasion. A joke goes around in uh, my office every once in a while, and it's actually something that my mentor's mentor told him, and then he passed it on to me, and it's that you really don't have to worry about what you're saying, because while you're talking, everyone else is just thinking about what they're going to say next. As conservatives, that's exactly the opposite of what our approach to communication should be. We should be the people that are asking questions and listening to hear the answer. And then as you listen to hear the answer, learn about who you're talking to and where they may be persuaded. We take this seriously at Heritage Action in our neighborhood canvassing program where the first thing that we do for any canvasser, any canvassing conversation is put 10 questions on the canvasser's iPhone. And when they walk to the door, the most important thing that we need is answers to those 10 questions. Why? Because every data point that we have about a potential voter in a potential neighborhood is the thing on which we base all the rest of our communication. Even if they disagree with us on 9 out of 10 of the questions, we can still use that one point of agreement and send them some mail, give them a phone call, maybe send a canvasser back to their door to convince them to come to our side. It's asking questions and then listening to and caring about the answers. Our first fun clip for you tonight is a case of that not happening. And for that to not happen, we need to go to Martin Basher. Um, what I want you to listen for and watch for as you look at this clip is, does Martin actually care about the answer to the question that he asks his guest a few times? Let's roll the clip. But in your book, Whores, Why and How I Came to Fight the Establishment, you write this. I have never engaged the services of a prostitute, but I have encountered a lot of whores in my career. People and interests who sell out their nation for money, power, and fame. So who is the whore in your opinion? Is it Ted Cruz or Mitch McConnell? Well, that was with regard to people in Washington generally. You know, it was Thomas Jefferson who said, Martin. I understand that, Mr. Clayman. I just wondered if I could take your very words, though, and ask you which of those two, Mr. Cruz or Mr. McConnell, is, in your opinion, a whore? Does Martin Basher actually care about what his guest says? The answer is obviously no, because he keeps repeating the question until he narrows and gets in on the one uh, piece of information he wants to gain from that guest mouse before he spends the rest of the interview throwing that over and over again, that this, this uh, Tea Party-related guest decided that, that Mitch McConnell was the whore in that scenario. This is really an awful, an awful case that you see over and over again on cable news, because Martin and other cable news hosts, they don't care about the answer to the question. They want to get some quote that they can then throw back in someone's face. That's exactly the opposite of the things that we just talked about, about listening first, listening to the questions that are answered. I think, so I do watch a little bit of television now and then. I watch uh, John Stewart at night sometimes, so the Daily Show. Isaiah is now retracting the statement that he just made about not watching any cable. I don't news, even have so cable. Let's fact check that I one. do not even have cable. <laughs> I, I am a child of this generation. Uh, the, 
the my favorite part is where John Stewart will take cable news and he'll mash them up how it seems somebody got into a room and said this is the phrase we're going to use today and then a hundred people on all these different networks go out and use the exact same phrase and repeat it over and over and over as if they're really smart one of the ones that grates on me the most is he shows how across all of these different news and commentary uh, organizations, you've got even Wolf Blitzer saying, you've got a guest on and the guest is talking, saying something important and nuanced and maybe based on expertise, and the, the, the anchor will interrupt and say, but is it good or bad? Good or bad? Good or bad? And it's like all of thought has to come down to a big chunk of, of yes or a big chunk of no, and that's just not where reality lives. Reality is messy. There are things that are partially good and partially bad. And if you can't acknowledge that fact, then you will never have a listening-based discussion, which means you're not actually having a debate. Two people are talking. So now we're going to uh, jump into one of my favorite parts of the show, which is where we get to answer questions that Carmela has selected from the you, the audience. So if you have a question, use the email address to send one, and let's, let's jump in. Um, for, well, first question is, uh, what do you do when uh, someone tries to pin you down like Martin Basher did in the clip? Hmm. So Isaiah, imagine you'd written that Tea Party book. What do you do? Actually, what I would say is when you clearly aren't going to get the words in that you wanted to, it's best to play along and do so with kind of, we talked about this last time, that bemused sort of look and feel, but just answer the question. and. When you just answer a question simply, you don't have to say that's the wrong question and start you know, debating people about it. Instead, if someone is going to be controlling and overbearing in a conversation, play along. It will be apparent to 100% of the audience that you think there's more to the story. And that in and of itself is enough to plant the seed of persuasion that the movement, the idea deserves for later. All of conservatism does not rest on your answer to one question from one pundit on one TV show in one moment. Yeah, that, that makes sense to me. I, I think of a time when I was speaking to a, an audience here in Northern Virginia at a, at a tea party gathering in the, the back room of a restaurant, and it was really clear to me that one member of the audience had to get this specific point in. It was something about an eccentricity in the Virginia Constitution. And he kept asking me the same question over and over again, probably three or four times, and I was trying to talk about how to be an effective activist related to the U.S. Congress. And this man was asking me a, just an optophic question, but he really wanted me to agree with him. And so finally, after he pinned me down, and even though I was trying to say my own point, I just had to agree with him. And I, I had to say, you're the expert on that. And if that's what you think, then that's probably what it is. And looking around the room, there was a lot of tension when I was trying to get away from that gentleman's question. But when I finally looked him in the eyes and answered it honestly, I saw the tension in the room dissipate, and the, the rest of the audience actually, I think, believed in the rest of what I said more because I let that man have his moment. Um, okay, so we have a question from Mike. Um, what, what is the best way to overcome a left-leaning independence um, initial uh, reluctance to speak with you um, about you know, uh, politics once you've identi identified yourself as a conservative? Hmm. So in that scenario, uh, it, it, it's, it's a little tough because I would be, if I'm putting myself again at the foot of my driveway dragging my trash cans out, uh, I probably don't want to identify myself as a conservative until I know more about the person I'm talking to. So maybe that's a way of getting around uh, Mike's question, but I'd really prefer to learn about what that, that gentleman's viewpoint is, where he's coming from before, uh, before I say where I'm coming from, which would be the, the right of the right wing, um, I want to know where he's coming from so I can find some point of agreement. Now, maybe if, uh, if someone has a, a, a reticence about conservatism and they figure out that I'm a, a right winger um, and, and there's that initial re reticence there, um, I would maybe just let them talk and let them accuse me of all these evil things that conservatives do and try to smile and be a genuine human being so that they realize that I'm not actually an evil person at least in that conversation. <laughs> and just like in any good conflict management situation, go ahead and confirm and repeat back what you're hearing. So you are saying that, that most of what you hear from conservatism makes people you know, look mean and bigoted and like they don't care about the poor 
Is that what you're saying? Get some confirmation, engage in the conversation. And in fact, go ahead and admit to some of the faults of your side. That can be a point of a dis a agreement that you move on from because that you see some faults but are still fully on a side says something. When someone sees you as reasonable enough to admit some weakness, then they also see you as reasonable enough to maybe believe about some of the strength. Finding that shared perspective in that moment is probably the most important thing you can do to keep the conversation rolling. Oh, yeah, I really like that, Isaiah. Um, imagine a, a liberal telling me that, that conservatives are all greedy and they have no love for the poor. That's a moment where I could be really defensive, or I could say, yeah, you know what? Some conservatives aren't concerned enough about the poor, but I am, and here's how. Or something like that where I, instead of just rebuffing them and saying, no, you're wrong, maybe give them a little point of agreement. Again, the conservative movement isn't going to fail because I cede a tiny bit of ground in one conversation with one person. And in fact, the conservative movement may gain a sympathetic friend as a result of me being a little genuine and a little honest. Okay. Um, so we have a question from Joy. Um, in the Twitter world, is there time to listen and ask questions? It seems like everything has to be said in sound bites. Mm. The Twitter world. That is, that is a tough world to play in. I, I made a mistake <laughs> yesterday. Um, I was participating in the hashtag, who should replace Martin Basher? And I said, a smart, intelligent conservative ought to be found and MSNBC should hire him and that should be the new three o'clock hour on MSNBC. Someone tweeted back to me and said, there's no such thing, oxymoron, smart conservatives don't exist. And I was trying to be a little sarcastic on Twitter, so I replied to that person and said, you're right, there aren't, there's no such thing as an intelligent conservative. The person then retweeted me with the hashtag truth, thinking that I had just on Twitter admitted that there are no intelligent conservatives. When have you seen a Twitter debate actually have tangible fruit in the real world? Hmm. That's, a, that's a tough one. Um, tangible fruit in the real world? Let me just walk back from that ultimate victory and say, I've had tangible fruit in the Twitter world. There is a, uh, a wacko liberal, a fringe leftist out in uh, Oregon, and uh, I think she lives in Portland. Her name's uh, Kristen. Kristen started following me on Twitter um, about two years ago, a year and a half ago, and we tweeted back and forth. I think we had something in common like a, a weird affinity for trains or something like that, and we were both tweeting about trains at the same time. But after a couple positive... I did not know you had an affinity for trains. <laughs> we're learning new things all the time <laughs> tonight. <laughs> after a couple like interactions about trains, I then, of course, being me, posted something uh, like linking to the Heritage website or making fun of the president or, you know, what, you, what conservatives do on Twitter. And this lady, Kristen, um, just ripped into me because I think she initially thought that I was liberal or at least moderate or something, and I just, you know, all my true colors fly out on Twitter at times. And we had this, this interesting debate where we had this point of liking each other about trains, and then, you know, we went off the, off the rails a little bit into this liberal versus conservative thing. But actually, in the end, she still tweets at me that she disagrees with about half of what I post to Twitter. But we have this kind of amicable Twitter relationship. And I think it's you know, probably a result of that we had a little, some like common ground that established the thing at first. And now she tweets about liberal things to me, and I tweet about conservative things to her. And there's, it's like detente, right? <laughs> um, so we should keep talking about Twitter, though, because it's, it's such a mess. I'm glad you found it actually useful. <laughs> I think of Twitter more as, as you know, there, because I, I work more in the business realm than the political realm where where any kind of marketing technologies are involved, I just know that so many Twitter users are absolutely fake. They don't really exist. Or there are some businesses following other businesses and you know exchanging lists of people and followers and things that uh, it really kind of seems irrelevant some of the times uh, what people are all excited about on the Twitter world. Whether it's political or business, it seems more like TMZ. Yeah, I, I would say that Twitter is probably worth a whole lot more, or Twitter is worth a whole lot less than this hypothetical conversation at the end of your driveway with your independent neighbor. You can have gain a lot more ground in two or three minutes there than you could in, in hours and hours spent on Twitter. But I like the, the practical angle of that question. Um, I think it's a great segue to our, to our second major point, which is skills, the specific tactics that we want to talk about tonight that will help you be an effective arguer and debater. 
And the first one uh, is actually one that Isaiah already mentioned, so he stole a little bit of my thunder with that uh, John Stewart reference. But I want to talk about creating and using memes. And uh, our society seems to be driven by memes, and, and you can see it if you listen to, if you watch Comedy Central, Colbert or Stewart, or even if you listen to Rush Limbaugh, he, he makes fun of the left at times by playing montages of commentators and hosts saying the same thing over and over again. In general, if one side of an argument is using one single phrase, it actually does take hold and it can be effective. And that's what a meme is. I think the left has done probably a better job at encapsulating campaigns and candidates or policies and causes in memes than the right has. Um, for those of us who are in the DC media market, we saw tons of advertising for the Virginia election. Uh, they were voting in a statewide election for governor, or lieutenant governor, and attorney general. And the left did a really good job of saying about all of the, the Republican candidates in that election that the candidate is focused on his agenda, not ours. It was on the TV, it was on the radio, it was on online advertising, everywhere, no matter what candidate it was, the Republicans were focused on their agenda, not ours. Now, the, the Republicans fought back a little bit. There was some counter-advertising there. The guy that ended up winning, the Democrat, is one of the sleaziest politicians you can imagine. But I think the meme did significant damage to the conservative cause. I'd love to see us come up with simple phrases that actually resonate at an emotional level with people. Because his agenda, not ours, doesn't really mean all that much in a society where in any given election, half the people vote one way and half of the people vote the other way. But it does create in people's minds this, this emotional connection. You know, you don't want to vote for someone who's against us, us, the, the community. You want to vote for someone who has us in mind. And by landing the meme, his agenda, not ours, I really think that the Democrats did themselves a great favor, especially in Northern Virginia and the D.C. media market. Yeah. Now, I like memes when they work. Isaiah was talking about how memes aren't effective. What are your thoughts? Well, uh, that's funny. I was thinking of a meme that there is one of me. Is there a meme of you? Have you ever had one? Have I ever had a meme of me? Ha have your staffers or interns ever made a meme of you? My no good brother has created many memes of me. Thankfully, none <laughs> of them have taken off on the internet. I, there's one of me uh, that's me like drinking coffee and the kids surprised me and I think I had a sort of condescending look on my face and it, all it says is sophomoric along the bottom and they send it to each other <laughs> when one of them does something silly. Like, that's sophomoric. <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, no, I actually, I'd like to, say, to back up to what you were talking about with, with the memes and walk me through an example. Take, take Obamacare, the Obamacare debate, because mm -hmm. I feel like that's an area where conservatives just said everything, at least yeah. in my opinion. It was like blah, 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 this, that, death panels to, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I, I, don't, I don't even remember everything. That's kind of a failure of communication that here I am saying like stuff. Yeah, yeah. stuff. Every what? blog entry was the 19 <laughs> problems with Obamacare, which right. means that you don't remember any of them. <laughs> right. I, I, I believe that the Obamacare debate could have been won, mm -hmm. and I think it could have been won early uh, ha had there been a meme. What, what would, can you walk me through how you would approach that debate as a, a strategist? Uh, so there's a difference between how I would approach the debate originally and how I'd approach it now. Mm -hmm. um, I think now, which is where I'm, I'm trying to focus on, now it, it may be easier to combat Obamacare than it was in the past simply because there's actually a law out there that's failing. And so now, as conservatives, I think we have the high ground and we can say, look, we know healthcare has problems and you know, maybe the president had a good intention to solve it, but it's not working. Obamacare is failing. And you can point to the website, you can point to the fact that almost every significant regulation has been delayed. You can point to the fact that they're having to advertise free birth control to try to generate support for the law. We can say, with kind of that, that shrug of, I'm sorry, but we can say it's not working, let's start over. Um, that's the kind of meme or message that I think will really land, especially as people in their everyday lives have experiences of employers cutting hours or dropping insurance coverage or premiums skyrocketing if you happen to stay on, ha actually have coverage. Um, all of those things can be summarized in a more emotional argument that's not about how the market has failed healthcare or let's give the market a chance to work in the healthcare industry. We can just talk about, look, the law isn't working. And that's a meme that I think could land and could be effective. So let's revisit an earlier point on that, on that very topic. If we're going to change our message to be about implementation of a law. Is it working or is it not? 
a great way to start a debate is to find agreement on the criteria by which we evaluate a law. Let's not talk about what's actually happening right now. Instead, let's find some agreement about, would you agree that if a loss fails to, to uh, accomplish its goals and costs X, Y, Z, whatever criteria you want to go with, we should consider scrapping that law regardless of the goals of that law. Try to debate around that and find some sort of agreement with your friend or whoever you're discussing with, a town hall, around what makes a law worthy of scrapping. Then have a less passionate debate around how is the state of Obamacare right now and does it meet any of those criteria. That's going to make them think. That's going to make you think. Uh, but it's a finding a point of agreement, the kind of ideal, before we talk about the actual, that def deflates much of the emotion and allows there to be a productive discussion. All right, let's keep talking about skills. Uh, one that I want to throw out there is the importance of avoiding overstatement. Overstatement is when you make a wild or sweeping claim instead of a tight, narrow claim, and it usually happens because you feel pressure. You feel like in order to win this moment, I'm going to have to say something, well, that's socialist, and socialism is always bad. And you end up far overstating the case in a way that defeats the credibility of the initial point you had. Debate is about small wins. It is not about completely changing someone in a conversion experience about politics in one conversation. That's never going to happen. And so it, it, we have a clip here that I want to show you because it helps us identify an interesting statement that becomes an overstatement and then we forget what the debate really should be about in the first place. Uh, so see if you can notice where the weakest point of this debate defeats the entire point. Let's go ahead and roll the clip. Look, so, oh, stop, we have, stop we have, a second. All right, there is Obama all, phone. We have always, let's get to the issue. We have always been a country, always. And liberals believe this, that has partnered individual entrepreneurship and hard work with the idea that we all do better together. Sally, That's why we Sally, created a, a nation, my Sean. Wait, That's why my, we created my a grandparents nation. came here at the As turn of the last mine. century. Yes. 38, 40, 45 dollars in their pockets. And guess what? They didn't have guaranteed health care and they didn't have an Obama right, phone. But we, and they but didn't we have a social the, security. We had the system. GI bill. My grandfather went to college I am on the GI you, bill. Is, we had the federally guaranteed has never been home this loans. High. You know what? Isaiah stole my clip. <laughs> <laughs> that was a clip that is supposed to illustrate how you can correct for the overstatement problem. The way to correct for the overstatement problem is to keep things simple. Now in that Hannity versus leftist commentator clip, what we saw was they started out with talking about our whole society, they moved on to immigration, they talked about their grandparents. Hannity gave three numbers of how much money his individual grandparents had in their pockets when they came to this country. The leftist commentator came back with a statement about the GI Bill. They covered so much ground in that 30 second interchange that actually nothing at all was accomplished and they violated my rule to stop overstatement which is less is more. Keep the focus narrow. If you can have a meaningful conversation about one small thing, to piggyback on what Isaiah just said, you actually may have a productive dialogue. What we saw on that Hannity clip was the opposite of productive dialogue. So let me ask you a question. When do you think a debate pays off? Just think about that for a second. Does a debate pay off in the moment? Or does a debate pay dividends far down the road? I'm asking you a question because I'm trying to emulate some of the style, but you're not here so you can't answer me. But I think the obvious answer is that a debate, the ramifications of it last far beyond the moment in which it takes place. And that's why you absolutely must keep yourself from overstating even if in the heat of the moment that means it seems like the initial point you were making doesn't seem as strong and you really want to talk about but everything, everything, everything and throw in the kitchen sink. Uh, maybe you should just stop talking. And that's okay. Saying you don't know is credibility. Saying, I don't think that the conversation is heading where I'm prepared for it to head. That's not fun, but it's credible. Overstatement over the top is a defeat to the initial point you were making, whereas stopping because you can't go further 
lends to its credibility over the long term, where the debate really is supposed to pay off. You want to try and roll that uh, John Stewart clip? What were you supposed to look for in that one, buddy? Oh, we were going to look at some other overstatement. We don't have to roll it anymore. Well, what I was excited for, because it's actually one of the right. entertaining pieces of, of Let's video. roll the John Stewart clip. The billionaire says, while most Americans struggle to make ends meet, we mega-rich continue to get our extraordinary tax breaks. My friends and I have been coddled long enough. I pay a lower tax rate on much of my income than my cleaning lady does. Well, to be fair, Warren Buffett's cleaning lady is also a billionaire. <laughs> Warren Buffett's op-ed was a thoughtful treatise on the advantages the super wealthy currently enjoy at the hands of the tax code. Or, to put that another way. Up next tonight, Warren Buffett, class warfare. More class warfare from an affable billionaire who should stop assuming the rich are all billionaires. Warren Buffett wrote an op-ed. Is he completely a socialist? <laughs> Is Warren Buffett a socialist? <laughs> so, so closing, Closing a few corporate tax loopholes and returning the top marginal tax rate to the 90s economic boom time levels is class warfare. So what just happened? Someone said class warfare, socialism, kitchen sink, bigger kitchen sink, hand grenade, tank, nuclear weapon, <laughs> all because Warren Buffett said something about himself and expressed an opinion that has to do with some facts that Jon Stewart was then able to piggyback off of and make the entire point that the conservative might have had look ridiculous. It's like talking about communism every time you have a discussion about tax policy when you are, are just so far removed from the nuance of this tax versus that tax versus the other tax. If you want to talk about communism, then you need to talk about the revolution of 1848. You need to have read the communist documents point by point and be able to draw an exact correlation to them or else you're overstating. That doesn't mean you need to go research communism right now. Uh, we're not really there as a country. It means that you need to use points that are appropriate to the subject matter that you're discussing and not rely on that old hand grenade that you think is going to work because it just makes us look like our ideas aren't any good. Literally all John Stewart did to defuse the entire Fox News argument was repeat what they said as a question. Is Warren Buffett a socialist? Argument gone. I feel like I your feel point. Like next. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> last skill. Last skill we want to talk this is about. A, this is a very technical debate skill, which is why Isaiah has to talk about it. Because when we were debate partners, he told me all the theory behind what we were doing and why. And then I just went out and did stuff. So pay attention. It may be a little technical, but I think it's actually helpful. Okay, actually, I, I, I just taught this very same thing to my boss. We, we agreed before the show not to talk about bosses at all, but I'm going to anyway. Uh, uh, he, he always says that, you know, if you, how comes you like to um, argue so much, but you tell me you don't want to argue about that? Well, we finally had a debate round, and we, we talked about this point, and I said, here's how you beat me. This is how you who have not participated in a debate round before beat me. And that's why we're teaching it to you. This is how you think through an issue on the spot and start processing your own ideas in a way that they become more effective. It's understanding the difference between mitigation, offense, and meta-debate. Very simply, mitigation is responding to the points that someone is making. That's an important thing to do in a debate. But sometimes that means that you're locked into debating on their turf or their ground and you don't question underlying assumptions. You need some offense to do that. So even if what facts you're saying are true, here are other facts or another take on those facts rather than me simply saying you're wrong. It's providing alternative viewpoints in addition to the viewpoint being discussed whether it's good or bad. Oh, I just used good or bad. Uh, third of all is the idea of meta debate. Sometimes, and this is the hardest thing to do, you have to discuss the very format itself. Sometimes you have to say, well, actually, I think that we have misstepped way back here before we even got to the point where we were, we went off course and we need to adjust. Or speaking times. 
I need to get about a minute and a half to get my next point in. Are you okay with me talking for a minute and a half? Then you can ask me 10 questions. That sounds really weird, but sometimes you need to be able to be present enough in your format that you're able to leverage it to get ideas in a certain way that they might need to be. And sometimes a debater will be debating you all in meta debate, like Joe Biden did when he walked all over uh, his opponent in the vice presidential debates. He owned his platform, so to speak, and controlled the debate via format, not via any type of content at all. You have to watch for meta debate and gently use it. Those are all three strategies are going on all the time and you have to balance them. Argue with the points they're making, but don't get locked into their turf. Bring up some alternative viewpoint and turf that can work too and understand how the conversation is going in the format that it is, which includes knowing that if somebody shoves a microphone in your face while you're at a rally in a city or a parade, you're probably not going to say something all that intelligent and it's probably going to make it to nightly news and be the talk of the town. That's why we don't want to engage in certain formats. This is a great point to stop and, and answer questions because we just covered a, a bunch of specific skills. Isaiah threw some terms at us. I threw a term out there, meme, earlier. So let's, let's answer some questions. Uh, yeah, uh, can you, before we go any further, can you explain what a meme is? So a meme actually originated as a term in biology, and it refers to a set of traits that combinations of genes pass on through different generations. So a meme is a trait that's, that genes pass on through different generations, subsequent generations. We've adopted it in the communication world, especially the online communication world, to mean any idea or concept that represents a whole ton of other concepts, but all you need to do is reference that one thing. And memes have this sort of multi-generational lifespan where something starts out serious, turns into a joke, other jokes are layered on top of it. So it's a little bit like biology, but in general for communication, meme refers to something where you're saying one word or one set of words to mean a whole pile of, of background stuff. Okay. Um, we have a follow-up question from Joy. Um, people don't, uh, seem to be willing to take the time uh, to engage these days. Um, so how should conservatives deal with that? I love that question. That's like a meta debate question, right? It because is. it's about how do you create the space to have these kinds of conversations. And I'll tell you, uh, Yellows may have a completely different view on this, but I think going back to this as a follow-up question to the Twitter question is sometimes engaging in a format that doesn't suit in-depth ideas is not going to be helpful and it creates a self-defeating cycle. So form follows function is a classic design term and a communication term, which is to say that the format in which you engage should follow the purpose of that format. If you intend to have an in-depth discussion, as you rightly pointed out, many people seem unwilling to engage in that discussion. You trying to engage in the mediums that do not lend themselves towards in-depth discussion to have in-depth discussion is self-defeating. Right, right. I, I... I actually agree with what Isaiah said, surprisingly. And the reason that I agree is because the proof is in the last few election cycles. For a whole variety of reasons, everyone thought that President Obama would lose his re-election campaign. For probably the same variety of reasons, everyone thought that Macker couldn't win the election here in Virginia. What drove them to victory wasn't necessarily TV ads. It wasn't necessarily debate performance in those televised show debates. What drove them to victory was individuals having conversations with their neighbors in such a way that those neighbors who didn't usually vote turned out to vote for their candidate. Um, you look at the young voter, the minority voter communities that turned out by and large for President Obama in 2012, that was driven by volunteers, one person responsible for three or four other voters in that community. And the kinds of conversations that had to happen to get those three or four voters to the polls those were meaningful conversations, the kind of conversations that I agree with Isaiah probably don't happen on Twitter or Facebook or in the comment section of a blog. I'm willing to bet that almost everyone on the other end of the camera and everyone in this room has probably had more intelligent discussions about politics within the past week than it feels like looks, looking at Twitter or any of the news organizations, the conversations they're having there. What that should tell you is actually a good thing. It's that the talking people who like to talk are talking and being on camera for it, but the real meat, the in-depth discussion, is not even happening there. 
It's not happening in that format. And that if you have tasted that or experienced that, you've probably had more impact and you've probably had better discussion than anything that's being play played over the airways. And frankly, that's where real influence lies. Okay, so we have a question from Sean. Um, speaking about truth, there are definitely some people on the conservative side, especially when it comes to religious beliefs and involving that into politics. Uh, that's definitely not only true to all conservatives. What would you say about people on either side about involving religious beliefs into political cause of the people? Hmm. That's a tough question. It violates the rules that I was taught as like a grocery store clerk when I was in high school, which was never talk about religion or politics. And so the question <laughs> is really, should we talk about religion in the context of politics? And that's a tough one. I mean, how do you answer that, Isaiah? I answer that pretty bluntly. If policy is based on doing something good, then you probably need to have a definition of good. That's going to involve religion. Now, there is a way to involve religion that is psychobabble, that is bringing perspectives, God's perspective, no matter from what source, into a debate where it doesn't belong. And then you've escalated the conversation far beyond policy implications. Some of our debates can be solved with policy implications. Some of them are philosophical and, and really have to do with whether there is and who is and what are the principles that are beyond human nature. That's the kind of debate that happened to form our country. Looking at social contract theory, look at George Washington's address about Thanksgiving. Those debates happened. Uh, and, and because deep motivations are behind policy, you have to be able to discuss them sometimes, but not in a frenzied form. And that can be certainly where, where the damage lies. Uh, so it's, it's a tough area, and that's really a fact of life, is that why we do things is tough. But that's up for debate, I think. Yeah, so you're saying that it's really hard to involve religion in a political debate, but sometimes it has to be there. So what are some tips on how to, how to bring that in? Good. Again, I would go right back to how we opened this, with listening and with questions. Because when you listen to someone and when you ask questions, you're going to discover whether you agree or disagree. And now the debate might become something different. But that might be where the debate is. Again, fundamental principle of debate. If you don't have shared assumptions, you have no business talking about the fruits of those assumptions and interpreting them. So you might have just discovered that the source of your disagreement is far deeper. And that's valuable to have discovered. It means your conversation is just going to be much deeper before you start discussing the implications of policies. Uh, so we have time for a couple more questions. Yeah, let's do one more questions on skills, and then I want to I want to move into stump the chumps, which is my favorite part of tonight's okay. broadcast. Okay. Um, let's see here. Stump the chumps. Um, so Piers Morgan, this is a, um, a question from Glenn. Um, Piers Morgan has a penchant for making up facts which are totally untrue. However, the guest most, most often has no opportunity to do any fact checking and expose this falsehood. There is only the sense that what is being advanced is wrong and makes no sense to go along with. So how does one deal with the falsehood that is being thrust upon someone who is being challenged to respond on the spot? Mm. How do you respond if you know your opponent is lying? Or, or as a salesperson, right? It's like, the person, you need to buy this. No, I, I really don't. Yes, you do. I you have that. these problems. No, no, I don't have those problems. Yes, you do. Uh, it's, a, it's a similar situation. Uh, it's, it's confronting a, a telemarketer. That's what you're doing. And so mm -hmm. to me, this is what parley debate is about. Parley debate is the kind of debate where you don't have any printed materials. You're only allowed to bring into the round what you wrote in your own handwriting in the 15 minutes of prep since you heard the topic. So oftentimes you hear things and you say, you know, I don't really agree with that fact, but I don't have counter data to support me at this time. And the strategy that you use is actually the obvious one, which is, I don't know why that's wrong or even am 100% sure that it's, it's wrong, but it sounds wrong and I don't believe it. And so I'm not going to engage on the debate on that subject. You can, you can do that. You can say, if it were true, then this, and you can still engage in the debate, but you can say, I, I don't really believe that. It takes a lot of credibility to kind of be able to call someone's facts into question like that, doesn't it? 
It takes some confidence to say, the same confidence it takes to say that you don't know something, mm -hmm. because that comes out at the same time. If you don't have the ability to counter a fact, you don't have to be a jerk about it. You say, I don't know, but that doesn't have the ring of truth. And if you know some facts about studies, you would actually be able to discuss that intelligently, which is you can talk about publication bias. One out of every 20 studies actually gets published. Typically, the most interesting studies are published. That means that much of the data floating out there is abnormal data. That's a, a, a well-documented fact. Uh, there's actually a study out there that shows how the majority of published research is wrong, which Wait, is so kind there's of self-defeating. There's published research that says published research is wrong? Yes. How do we know what to believe? <laughs> it's historical. It's a fact. Uh, uh, so the, the point being, I think, put, your shoes, put yourself in the shoes of the audience. When the audience hears Piers Morgan say something that sounds patently not true, and the person who's on television, along with Piers Morgan, also thinks that, is it that far-fetched for that person to say, you know, that doesn't really sound like it has the ring of truth to it? The audience is going to be nodding their heads up and down because they would be worried about being in the same position but probably think the same thing and not know the words to, to use to say that. It's, it's, it's really about being honest and authentic about it. So let's move to my favorite part of the broadcast, Stump the Chumps. We were in a coffee shop right before we, we came over here and we wrote down what are scenarios that you, the audience, may find yourselves in and how would we approach those scenarios? So I'm going to give the first one to Isaiah. This is a scenario I actually found myself in, so I'm curious to see how he responds. But imagine I'm hanging around a political campaign for a while and as I'm hanging around that campaign, we, we run into this situation where the candidate actually has the chance to debate the other candidate. How do I help my candidate prepare for a debate in the town hall? Great question. I've actually had a chance to do this before, to help a, oh, a candidate. Oh, curious. Yes, I know. We may have done this together at one point. <laughs> there we go. Um, one of the things that I think is most important is to help your candidate avoid overstatement. You need to help your candidate not make it be about socialism and communism which a candidate is want to do because that's more fun to talk about, but to make it be about the small issues and the small facts that are actually pertinent to the discussion. To do that, you probably have to know your content and help your candidate know their content. So really, putting yourself in the perspective of an audience member who is not swayed to either side, that's really the, the core audience to which the, the candidate is debating. You have to pretend to be that person or even go grab some people like market research. When people research for a product, go grab some people who fit that profile. Mm -hmm. Ask them questions. Ask them what they think and see what are the shared assumptions they have. Let me call those out and help my candidate be armed with shared assumptions. And what are the facts that are most surprising to those people? Whether I'm predicting that or actually know the facts that are most surprising to those people, have the candidate use those facts and keep the claims narrow. Th those are really the three strategies I would use. Put yourself in the shoes of the audience, use facts, avoid overstatement. Yeah, the, the one thing I'd add on that is, is a bit of a practical thing, and it's that most candidates, especially for state and local office, have never actually seen themselves on TV or on the camera or on the stage. So the number one thing that I'd say is get your iPhone out or a small video camera mock debate for 10 minutes and then let the candidate watch himself or herself debate and after they go through the practice after they go through a little review session i think that'll be the best 20 minutes or half hour of debate prep that you can do and bring be some able chocolate and strawberries <laughs> because they're gonna, they're, gonna like they're gonna feel awkward when they watch themselves on the camera but that's the number one thing that i'd say so you brought this up earlier, Isaiah. What, what do we do when we find ourselves accidentally on TV? When a local <laughs> news reporter just happens to be there with the camera in front of my apartment building? What do right. I say? What do I do? So, so this question brings up to me what I think are the most classic moments in, to me of television of the last about 10 years are when the Tea Party got started and there were rallies and the camera was shoved in the face of Tea Party member, and, and then when there was the, uh, what was the Wall Street thing? I'm trying to forget it because I don't want it to be like written down in history. March on Wall Street. Occupy. Up, Occupy. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Occupy Wall Street. Same thing. Both groups, when cameras were shoved in their faces, at, at least the ones that we saw, right, the people who were asked questions like, what does this group stand for, said the most ridiculous things I've ever heard on both sides. So we, we kind of have to see that from from the liberal perspective and from the conservative perspective. Both sides fail at this. 
So how do you not fail? That's the question. So though. you stick a camera in front of my face, and you, you stick a microphone there, and you ask me a question. If I don't know, I need to say I don't know. I, it's, it's back to what we started this whole evening with, which is if you're good at saying lots of words in your own mind, you might just be good at saying lots of words. That doesn't mean you have great content. And we need to avoid saying content that's not properly vetted. That hurts you. It hurts all ideas and facts being discussed to throw out junk. Mm -hmm. And so you probably need to decline unless you have something really valuable to say. If it's going to happen anyway, say you don't know frequently. It's like the rule that Thumper's dad tells him in Bambi right before uh, right before they're, they're talking and he says, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. And honestly, Walt Disney was probably right and wise to say that. That actually goes for Twitter too, now that I think about it. There's a recent study out there about uh, social media performance, which says, basically it has all these different quadrants of, of what types of social media are most successful and least successful. The most successful ones, keep it positive and keep it interesting and also don't talk Never mind about family members and things. <laughs> <laughs> say really mushy stuff. So here's the last stump the chump that I want to throw at you before okay. we uh, before we break for questions. Well, that's fine. I'm going to okay. do mine first because right. I'm selfish. <laughs> this is one that I hope most people in the audience find themselves in, and it's what do you do? How do you prepare for? How do you conduct yourself when you get finally, as an activist, get that five minute conversation with your senator or your yeah. representative? How do you, how do you, what do you do in that moment? How do you prepare? You're fine, you've worked all this time for accountability and you finally get in their office. What do you say? Right, so we're assuming this isn't a surprise, right? You, you worked hard to be there. Yeah. Good. I think that you, this is a challenging moment because you probably spent far, far greater efforts to get to the moment than you will spend once you're there. And sometimes it's easy to forget about that. It's like, it's like a salesperson randomly getting the call to come talk to a CEO of a Fortune 500 company who wants to hear about your product. All of a sudden, wait, what do I, what do I say? <laughs> um, you have to find the crux. That is what is hard, but it's what happens when you know your content. When you know your content well, you have communicated about it with other people hundreds of times for lots of amount of time and that allows you to boil it down to the most persuasive, elegant, relevant statements that are possible. You will have the two to three most important facts and two or three opinions or pieces of spin about it phrased in a persuasive way. That's really what you need to be armed with. And it's just like a general saying, I need the 30 second elevator briefing on what happened across the world tonight that's where you are. You have a moment to shine, put the best piece of content you have forward, and you know what happens most of the time? If someone's interested, if someone's actually willing to consider your best piece of content, they're gonna ask you questions. You're going to end up in a follow-up conversation. So it's not your one chance to save conservatism, it's your one chance to start someone thinking differently and maybe lead to more chances to start pe more people thinking differently. Absolutely, the way I'd approach that is um, put yourself in the senator's shoes for a second. He probably talks to hundreds of activists and donors and lobbyists every day, and you, you probably just need to, to do a pause and time out and say, look, I know I'm just one person or it's just me and my three friends, but we feel really strongly about this one thing, so remember this one thing. I think that look, here's where we are, here's who we are moment, can be one of real genuineness and authenticity instead of a moment of here are the 95 things that I've really wanted to tell you for the past year. So I, I'd use that look, here's where we're at, here's what we're thinking about. Be honest, maybe be even a little, a little informal and that's where you can really um, begin to build a relationship and maybe they do call you back or bring you in for, for another conversation. Uh, this is really great. We are um, a little bit short on time, so I think we have one more question that uh, is a good one. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. They were some really good ones. Um, but this is a question from Mike. Um, the left-wing media is expert at simplistic demonization. What is the best way to get past a liberal's preconceived, uninformed opinions of what conservatives really represent? <laughs> That's like the $900 question, right? Mm -hmm. How do you get past a liberal's preconceived notions 
about who conservatives are, what we represent, you got to be a real human being. Um, and that's probably one of the difficulties about Twitter, and maybe one of the reasons why uh, Kristen on the West Coast and I actually have a little Twitter friendship is because you're actually a real human being. You know, you may be the only true movement conservative that this liberal person has ever come across. You know, be a little self-aware and say, you know, I don't suck on the blood of children at night. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just if they're trying to demonize you, you got to put a smile on your face and be be a genuine human being. You can't fight back all of the all of the lies, all of the accusations, all of the cultural baggage that we, have we as conservatives have in one conversation. But you can make one good impression as a conservative that has a little self-awareness and a little humility. If you think about it, the reason that there is demonization from liberal pundits is because there's some extreme that's happening in the name of conservatism, sometimes even in the name of God, that is providing their ability to prove their point. And that extreme doesn't represent you or anyone. But if the concern of the liberal is you don't seem to care about people and you can't honestly point to a case where you have cared about people, then the problem's with you. But if you can, then you can diffuse that part of the conversation and start to find some agreement. Oh yeah, I care about people too. We're, we're both human. <laughs> <laughs> we do have that? that in common with liberals. We <laughs> both happen to be human beings, right? Amazing. <laughs> That's commonality. You can build a friendship just from that shared shared human experience. Right? Actually, in today's <laughs> world, that's pretty cool. <laughs> pretty cool. I'm like, you're a human. We should hang out. Yeah, we should. <laughs> <laughs> well, if that was the last question, I would I would ask Mike, the questioner, to just listen to what we're up to, tweet at me, and we can continue to, to dialogue about how to be authentic and genuine and dispel some of those myths and rumors about evil conservatives. Great. Well, I want to thank both of you, uh, Nathaniel and Isaiah, for joining us tonight. I'd like to thank our audience. Um, our next webinar is Tuesday, December 10th at 3 p.m., um, and it is called Rules for Radicals with Chris Doss. Um, this uh, webinar was recorded. Um, and it will be on our website, leadershipinstitute.org backslash activism on demand backslash. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Carmel. Happy to be here.